It's Mitzi Mike, and this is the Wave Social Podcast powered by Arcade Studios, a show for marketers, creators, and brand builders who want to make waves online. And as always, we sit down with the experts and tastemakers behind today's up and coming brands. And today on the show, we have Mary Young, CEO and designer of her namesake clothing brand, Mary Young. Yeah, this is a really fun episode. We talked a lot about values and how she kind of built her business around the values of like sustainability and inclusivity way before it became like the popular thing to do. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool to see how her brand has evolved and maintained those values through all the things that she's doing with it. Yeah, and values are always a tricky thing because mo- many brands and businesses say they have values, but mm-hmm. to actually see them in practice is another thing. And that's one thing that we've always really respected about Mary. And we get into it a little bit in the interview, even just in the sense of how much time and energy and even like business resources she's invested in building community, for example, totally. around some of the specific values that she has without it like relating directly to sales, which yeah. is uncommon. Yeah, and it's like hard to do as a business owner yeah. to like justify it. And to keep doing it, yeah. like not just in the first year or two years as like a tactic, but totally. as like a sustaining or like long-standing activity of a founder or the business even Definitely. after you're established. So Yeah, and we talked a lot about social media because she started her business in the like golden era of Instagram where you mm. could just like have a cool brand on Instagram and just get a bunch of um traffic and conversions from it. So yeah, there's obviously a yeah, she's had to pivot quite a bit and just been cool to watch her do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is the second to last episode of the season of Waves. Right. We are going to be taking a little break. I'm going to have a baby, hopefully, in the next week you or can't so. Tell. She's ready to pop. <laughs> um, and then we'll be back in the new year with new episodes. But in the meantime, you can wet your palate if you mm. miss us at Tea for Lunch, which is our other podcast, goes um I think it's available on streaming platforms every Friday morning and available on Instagram Live on Thursdays. Yeah, we record it live, post it on podcasts on Friday. But then also, for those of you who've been watching along on YouTube, on the same YouTube channel, we're also going to be dripping the Tea for Lunch episodes as well. So Yeah, and Tea for Lunch is a short, bite-sized version of this not really a version of this podcast. It's actually totally different than this podcast. It features but, us. Yeah, like we're on it podcast. sometimes. I won't be on it as much, but it's basically a 15-minute show that covers marketing, pop culture, what's going on in the world, um, and has some fun takes to it. So you should j- check it out if you haven't already. If you like the Kardashians. <laughs> we don't only talk about the Kardashians. We talk about just stuff in pop culture, and they happen to be making news in pop culture. (laughs) Touche. Well, Mary launched her clothing line in 2014, and since its inception, the brand has been featured in notable publications like Refinery29, Fast Company, and Business Insider. The brand is on a mission to ignite and inspire moments of self-love and acceptance through intimates, swim, and more. Her vision and passion for self-care, sustainability, and all-around positivity can be felt through the brand Mary Young as well as her, as her personal social channels. And outside of growing the brand, she's often a guest on podcasts like this one, panels and events to share on growth as an entrepreneur, personal development, and most importantly, destigmatizing the idea of self-love as a bubble bath and candles. Yeah, so Mary's go awesome. check it out. She's great. You're going to enjoy this episode. And yeah, I can't wait to hear what you think about it. Okay, we have the one and only Mary Young on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super thrilled to be here. We're so excited. Um, So we want to go back at the beginning. Before you started Mary Young, what were you noticing in the market that you felt like there was a need to either change or introduce something new? Like, what was it that sparked that desire to jump into intimates? For me, growing up, like from a very young age, I looked at clothing as a tool to make you feel better. So dressing up on a certain day made you feel more confident, made you more excited to go somewhere. Always like having a nice birthday outfit was like a very big thing as a teenager. And so that's how I always looked at fashion as a a way to help um, boost your mood or your confidence. And then as I aged and became a young woman, I realized a lot of fashion was 
not doing that for me and Mm -hmm. not serving me. And I think that was when I really realized there was a huge opportunity within marketing and fashion as a whole, not even an intimates. It's just the, the marketing aspect was so narrow. And as a white woman, I never even saw myself reflected because I wasn't blonde and blue eyed and, you know, five, nine and a certain type of skinny. I just didn't see myself in most clothing brands, especially when it came to intimates. And it's the first thing you put on in the morning. And it's really what does set your mood for the day. And so I knew that if I didn't feel reflected in what I was buying and spending a lot of money on and wearing every single day, then the market itself was not doing enough service to, um, you know, the consumers and the community and it really was letting women down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like fast forward a little bit, you like, were you entrepreneurial when you were growing up? Like, do you think that you'd ever start like a fashion line and even like with that desire of like making fashion feel like make you feel good is that something that you saw for yourself it was the only thing I saw for myself actually so from like the age of I think around four I actually wanted to be a model but then I realized I was like too small I was never gonna grow tall enough I was already like 50th percentile in size at that age so (laughs) I was like okay modeling is not it but what do I like about modeling it was the clothes and so I started making clothes for my Barbies, knitting, crocheting, anything and everything. And then by the age of like 14, I was doing an internship with a fashion designer. I was designing my logo for my clothing company. And it always just felt like that's what I wanted to do. I didn't think I would do it so young, to be honest. I really thought I would enter the industry, work somewhere, gain a lot of knowledge, um, be able to, you know, hone in on like my skill set and then decide what category of fashion or what type of entrepreneurship journey I wanted. But things had a different plan. And I started the business when I was 23. That's ex- so cool that you knew that from the young age. Um, <laughs> I love that. When did like what sparked you to start it? Like what start- sparked you to start like Mary Young's and speci- specifically Intimates? It actually was not a plan. So like I said, I didn't think I would be doing this right away. But in my fourth year at uh, Ryerson, which is now Toronto Metropolitan University, um, I was doing my thesis and I was in fashion communication. So it was a bit more of like a marketing and communication thesis. But being always creative and into fashion, I decided to do a double thesis and do a women's intimate collection. And to be honest, I did intimates because I thought I would save money on buying fabric to make five outfits instead of having to make like tops and pants or jackets and dresses. I was like, oh, this will be great. I can buy three meters of fabric. I'm a student. I don't have money for this, but I can do a whole collection and then it'll it'll be done and it'll be great. And then as I started researching the industry and seeing like really how shallow of a market it was in terms of like what it was offering women, it was either like Fruit of the Loom, five pack of nude underwear that you would never want anyone to see you in, but you would wear it every day. Or Mm -hmm. like padded push up black lace, overtly sexy as a, you know, wearing for someone else, but there was really nothing in the middle. And that's where I felt I was looking for was something a bit more in the middle about celebrating your natural shape that you could wear every day. And so that's what the collection became. And then after I showed the collection in my graduating, like, um, fashion show, I guess is what we called it then. A lot of people started messaging me on Instagram and asking when they could buy it and when they could buy it. So I thought, you know what, like maybe, maybe I should look into this. So I sat down and wrote a business plan. And then it turns out my business plan was bigger than my thesis. So I was definitely very interested in pursuing this. That's so cool. So when you wrote your business plan, you thought like, oh, I I can get a few sales. But were you envisioning like this long term like business that would be growing and kind of like sustaining you for the last few years? I mean, yes and no. Like I always thought, oh, like it'll be so simple. I'll start a business and it'll just like take off, but Mm -hmm. not in the same way that it did. Like my business plan was all about like being in wholesale accounts and going through like traditional retail, which in 2014, we were on the cusp of things changing. And so as the brand grew 2015, 2016, I realized I was like, oh, like wholesale accounts really aren't like the bread and butter of fashion anymore. Like you can sell direct Mm -hmm. to your consumer online through pop-ups. And so the business plan was a great roadmap, but it's definitely evolved far beyond what I thought it would have. Yeah, we definitely want to get into that stuff, but I'm curious about values Mm because obviously you've said that 
you kind of happened upon this, you know, mm-hmm. as a project and even like the intimates because it was cheaper yeah. which is such an interesting, interesting perspective that I didn't, that I didn't know that that was part of it. But how did you develop your values over time? Because obviously at this stage, mm-hmm. Mary Young, the label knows, you know what your values are, you lead with them. And that's a big part of what um, draws the consumers that you have. So what was the process between what we see today and where you started in the classroom developing what those are and how you talk about them. To be honest, the values haven't changed, which I think is one of the greatest things of the brand is when I wanted to start the business in 2014, I had hopes for producing in Canada and also working within the fashion industry in Canada, especially going into university four years prior. There were so many companies based in Toronto, Montreal, producing here in Canada. And then by the end of my four years, majority of them had left Canada. They were overseas, even like headquarters were no longer in Toronto. And I realized like we kind of turned our back on our economy within this specific industry. Like fashion is very well known in Canada and we are not supporting it anymore. So from day one, producing in Canada was number one. I never looked overseas. I never looked in another continent. It was always how could we produce in our own backyard and invest into our economy. And then the other factor was about sustainability and having, you know, fabrics that were natural because intimates are intimate parts of your body. They, you want soft, comfortable fabrics that are breathable and good for you. And that was really never talked about in the intimates category before. Like no one ever talked about you shouldn't be wearing spandex rayon, you know, 24 hours a day because it's really not good for your health. And so that was one of the biggest things was finding fabric that was good for your health as well as comfortable and had a long life and had a smaller impact on the planet. So we've been using rayon from bamboo since the very first collection we've been producing in Canada. We've been making our tags like that go on the inside of the garments in Canada. It's always been Um, Just about how we can make an impact, even if we're only selling, you know, 40 bras or we're selling 4,000. It's how can we take the smallest amount of our labor and our work and make, you know, a bigger ripple effect here in our country. That's awesome. And some of your values like around sustainability and even inclusivity, they've become like pretty widely adopted by Mm -hmm. tons of big brands, small brands. Um, And I know like even right now, like company values are so important to consumers and it kind of like it's almost like a marketing thing, like what sets you apart from your competition or other people in the market. How have you managed to like maintain that as things have evolved and things have grown? Um, And how do you keep like your values at the center of what you do? Yeah, I think, like you said, it's very popular now. Like almost every brand is really focusing on inclusivity and diversity and sustainability, which is amazing to see. But there's a lot of like greenwashing in that space as well in terms of like sustainable practices. And um, one thing that we try to do is just be as honest and authentic. Like there's some fabrics that we use that aren't 100% sustainable, but that's something that we're working on changing. And as a smaller brand, we don't have the same buying power that larger companies do to purchase sustainable materials. So as we continue to grow, those are things that we're working our way to improve and always do better. And I think the biggest thing for us in terms of our values, and even for myself as an individual, is being able to humble myself and know that I'm never going to be perfect. I always want to continue to grow and strive and do better. And I always welcome feedback from our customers and community if they think that we've done something that either has offended them or has missed the mark. Like I want to hear that because it's the only way that we're going to continue to grow and do better and have an open conversation. Like we're a brand that we want people to feel like they're one of our friends. They, We want them in our DMs. We want emails from them. It's not this sort of like robotic bot on the back end of a you know a computer that's answering them it really is a person and i want that feedback so that we can keep doing better and making sure that our community feels you know seen heard and valued every step of the way yeah not to put anyone on blast <laughs> but are there <laughs> any mistakes that you see other brands make when it comes to like integrating their values or leading with their values um Especially if they're like in that, like you mentioned, like there's some greenwashing that happens and we all have seen it and can recognize it. But like, what are there any examples or something that you've been seeing specifically? Yeah, I think a lot of brands have been jumping on the sustainable trend, which I think, again, is really great, but they're not pulling the curtains back the whole way. So they may be using sustainable fabrics, but they 
aren't, you know, watching their production numbers, they're still, you know, offloading dead stock material or products. We hear about, you know, how many garbage bins are found with like brand garments that still have the brand tag on them that haven't been sold, you know, burning of garments, things like that. Like fashion is one of the biggest wasteful industries in the world and we don't really see that. So I think especially as bigger brands and brands that become bigger is watching your footprint and how you can minimize your production. And even if that means like selling out, like that can be a good thing. It means you produce the right amount and you're not stuck with, um, you know, product or material that no one wants and then therefore goes to a landfill. So the transparency through the whole journey is what I think a lot of brands are missing. They're really pushing forward with, oh, you know, we produce with sustainable material or we have recyclable packaging or even compostable packaging is one of the newest ones. And majority Mm -hmm. of places, the compostable packaging actually isn't compostable. You can't compost it. And uh, a lot of cities won't actually accept it. So it's like looking at that and looking where your major cities and key points are and how you can be as um, transparent and sustainable to those customers and communities, I think is a big thing. I've heard you talking a lot about community and like relationships and like creating two-way dialogue with your customers and things like that. And on that note, I'd love to talk a little bit about the self-love club Mm -hmm. as something, a big part of your brand and the relationship that you've developed with some of your most loyal customers. So what does that look like? What what goes into the self-love club club and where did it come from? The self-love club is also such a, an organic part of the brand. So I feel like everything that has happened, I've kind of stumbled into it, which feels like such a blessing at the end of the day is um, during the first couple of years of the business, when we were doing pop-ups and by we, I mean, mostly me <laughs> doing pop-ups, <laughs> I was having a lot of like one-on-one conversations with customers and even getting like DMs and emails about this is the first time that they've purchased lingerie as an act of self-love and that they never thought that they could buy something that empowered them first and didn't think about someone else. And we were having more of these conversations, like I was having a conversation here and then there and so on and so forth, but it wasn't ever a community conversation. And I realized a lot of the conversations I always have around self-love, we were all experiencing, but no one really knew other people were going through it. We kind of were isolating ourselves and our experiencing and making sure that, you know, we weren't too vulnerable in a public space because we didn't want people to judge us or things like that. And, um, it's so important to have community. We've realized this specifically over the past two years that community is really what keeps you going and um, keeps you feeling loved. And so that's one thing that we really wanted to invest in. So the self-love club is a movement that Mary Young powers. It's not about like buying our products. A lot of people are like, well, I don't, I don't own anything yet. I'm like, you don't have to. It's not, it's not about wearing and buying Mary Young. Like you, you will be allowed in if you don't own any of our stuff. And it really is just a space to have these open and honest conversations around self-love and acceptance. And it's so easy as a lingerie brand to start talking about, um, you know, body acceptance and your physical self-love, but we've really wanted to expand that into so many different aspects. So it's not just about how you look and how you feel with your body, but it can be self-love through losing a job or moving across the country or losing a loved one or going through a pandemic, like all these different aspects of how do you care for yourself and love yourself when life feels really hard and not manageable. And so that's really what that space is. It's sort of an extension of the values of Mary Young in terms of what I believe in, what we as a company believe in, and we want um, something as intimate as bras and underwear to start that conversation, but then take people in so many different directions. I think that's so, it's so cool that you do that. And like, it sounds like such an interesting concept, but as a business owner myself, I I feel like my brain also goes to the practicality Mm -hmm. of it. Like, okay, it's not about buying product. Mm -hmm. You don't have to own anything to be part of it. Obviously, and those types of conversations obviously take energy too and like a certain mindset. So how do you as a founder and like someone who's obviously very busy (laughs) developing their product and trying to like grow your business have the energy and the capacity to also just like nurture these honest, no strings attached conversations? I don't. um, Full transparency, I don't have energy for that. Uh, It definitely was easier in like the early years that it started. And we would do a lot of like in-person events that I would host. And, you know, obviously I had a small team, so certain interns would support and help with that. And 
as it's grown and as the self-love club has sort of become its own entity aside from Mary Young, we actually have a self-love club editor now. So Malika on our team, she's the the editor behind it. She does a lot of research. We explore a lot of those conversations together. Her and I are constantly talking, like probably a little bit too much. I'm like, which platform are we messaging on today or all three? (laughs) Um, But so I'm always in tune with her about the self-love club and growing that. And she's been able to really take that to the next level. And we have consistent um, content that we release every single week and every single month. And it's not just, again, about like the physical body, but it's about bringing people in to experience the feeling of the self-love club. And then that's also a feeling you get from Mary Young. So our goal is if at some point someone who's, you know, a loyal self-love club reader is looking to purchase something new, they may be inclined to shop with us because they know that they already feel loved and accepted in our community. And so therefore with our product, they're also going to have that feeling. I want to cool. uh, rewind a little bit and talk about like how you've grown. Like you've mentioned, like you were a small team, mm-hmm. you had a few interns, you did a few things in person, like, post um graduation and post your like thesis and when you decided okay this is something I want to pursue and like try what happened next like talk to us about like how that has grown and then where you're at now just to give some context to how the business of Mary Young has evolved I mean it has evolved let me tell you so at 23 (laughs) I think one of the best things was I was young I had a lot of energy and I was really confident in my idea and what I wanted to do so um, coming from a very small town moving to Toronto I felt like I've already accomplished so many things by pursuing my dreams and this was just sort of another thing So instead of going the traditional route of, I guess, finding investment, I took out a bunch of loans. I had my own savings and I worked with an organization in Canada called Futurepreneur and they support young entrepreneurs. They help you with your business plan. They provide you with a mentor. Like it's a really amazing um, program to help entrepreneurs get off the ground. And so that's how I self-funded the company. And for the first probably almost three years, two and a half years, I worked part time at other jobs doing graphic design, editorial design, website design, I modeled, I would do literally any job basically that someone would pay me a reasonable amount for I was just like, okay, whatever I need to do in order to continue to grow Mary Young is what I have to do. And then I was able to get some interns through um, Ryerson and through other schools, just being able to provide them with learning and knowledge, very hands on learning at that point, because it was such a small business. And over the years, it's definitely grown. And I've made a lot of great decisions. And I've learned a lot of uh, good learnings from making the wrong decisions about like hiring and things like that. And the team is still really small, like there's only four people on the team, we work with a lot of Um, freelancers and people on, you know, different basis that we need. Our production facility is not Mary Young's production facility solely. So Mm -hmm. that's not something that I have to manage, thank goodness, because I'm also learning how to become a manager. And that's a whole other job on top of my current job. But it's definitely been a slow growth in terms of the team growing and finding the right people to build it up. And I think that was a very intentional decision of mine. And we see a lot of glorification around Series A, Series B funding, and you know, businesses grow from 10 employees to 120 employees. And it can look really great. And it can be really great. But it's oftentimes when you grow that rapid, you lose your core values and your mission and what the brand stands for. And that's something that has been so true to me from the very beginning that I don't want to lose as the brand grows. So it's been great to, like I said, what we were doing in 2014, we're still doing now. It hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. We still believe in the same thing. Our, you know, team believes in it just as much as I believe in it. And so it's been able, uh, been really nice to be able to grow it at this pace and to still get a little bit of sleep here and there. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I feel like people really glorify fast growth and like adding people to your team is Mm -hmm. not as glamorous as it sounds. It comes with so many pain points and so many like learnings with that and finding the right people. There's like turnover, more overhead. Um, We've kind of like been back and forth about like what's the ideal size of, of at least for us even but um, it's it's yeah, I don't know. I hope that people can see, you know, slowly that like small teams that make big impact, like I feel like that's the sexiest thing. Like that's the thing that you want to see more of and not just like these huge like 
50 plus people teams that are, you know, doing things at scale, but are they really making an impact? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the muses too. That's another part of, um, your brand that I think is really interesting. And what was the inspiration behind starting that as an editorial project? And then where has it evolved? Yeah. So the muse series also started like really early. I think it was 2015 that we started doing muses and, to be honest, again, it was like an extension of something that I was passionate about. I look around me and within my community and again, like social media and online presence of a lot of different inspiring individuals. And it's like, these are women that I look up to that I have, you know, what they say, a girl crush on. I'm very into what they're doing, what they stand for, the conversations that they have, who they are as a person. And again, I think if I find inspiration and connection to this individual, I'm sure our community also will. And again, seeing different walks of life, different paths that people have taken and journeys and being able to relate to that is a big part of the Muse series. So we want to, you know, highlight real people who are chasing their dreams, that are doing their own thing, that are advocating for different communities, that are speaking up in different places and just being authentically themselves. And so instead of looking at role models as like just Michelle, Michelle Obama, which like we love her, we, we're not going to knock her down, but there's a lot of people between, you know, birth and Michelle Obama that are also role models. And so we want to be able to highlight those people within our community that we think are doing a lot of things. And then it's another great way of showing how Mary Young as a brand celebrates diversity and, um, you know, different body shapes, different ages, different paths of life and, and different like locations as well. We try not to just stick to Toronto because it's easy to just be in your backyard all the time. Yeah, I love the variety of women that you have, like, featured there. It's such a cool series. Did you always want, it just feels like editorial is a big theme of your brand, like, yeah. not just with the self-love club and muses, but just in general. Has editorial, like, always been something that you wanted to be part of, like, as a pillar of your brand? And, like, is it something that, um, or is that something that has, like, naturally just happened? That's definitely something that's naturally happened, and I didn't even really realize it was happening for the first couple of years that it was. I just thought these were great extensions of the brand and a great way for storytelling. But then when I look back at my education, I did do some courses within like the editorial space. I had worked as a freelancer working on different magazines and things like that. So I know growing up, I would always love to buy my stack of magazines, you know, read the stories, see the different editorial spreads and things like that. So as a millennial, I think that was a very big thing for us was having your magazine subscription and going to the, you know, the newsstand and getting them all. So I think this is a great way to bring that sort of feeling back. But I also think that it's a nice way to make things not feel so like adsy or full on marketing, because I think we're so inundated with so much marketing everywhere we go. Everything's on sale. If you buy now, you can pay later. Like there's all these different marketing terms and things like that, that I mean, they get me the way that they get everyone, but it, it also feels like we're always like overwhelmed by them. And I don't want us to be another one of those um, sort of like in your face marketing channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of like how things have changed, like I know Instagram was a big part of like mm -hmm. your community and how you built your community and, you know, found customers and things like that. And now you know, things have evolved so much with so many other platforms coming up. Um, and I'm curious, like back in those early days, like how did you find, like, uh, did Instagram help you find like virality or like those first few customers or like that first bit of community? Like what was the role that social media played, I guess, in like kind of bringing all these people in conversations and like even the self-love club into like one platform? Like, is that where most of that community piece happened? Yeah, it was hugely Instagram. I would say that um, in 2014, like even getting messages on Instagram from people I didn't know was very new at that point. Like it was sort of like when you just started following people you didn't know or maybe certain bloggers were getting on Instagram. So it was a great way to build that community. And I had like a little formula for how to post and what type of content like we now call them like content pillars and you want to have something from this bucket and that bucket. Um, so I was doing that even in 2014 and I was very lucky to be able to work with some 
bigger brands. So I partnered with Nike and Canada on a couple different campaigns. And that was really huge to align um, not only myself, but also the brand Mary Young with such a huge company like Nike. And that uh, got us a lot of followers so that we had some legitimate legitimacy on the internet because at the time, like if you had under a thousand followers, people thought you were like not a real company or you weren't really that big. So it really did start on Instagram. There was a lot of two-way conversations, DMs, like all of that good stuff was was really on Instagram and we didn't do marketing. We didn't put any like money into marketing until probably 2019 and really 2020 is when we started to think about it seriously. So we really grew through word of mouth and organically and it was really social media. Like we had Facebook as well, but I would say Instagram was such a huge pillar to our early success. Mm -hmm. Can you add on to that and just talk about how that's changed over the last couple of years? Oh. Like Obviously, Instagram still plays a part, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily as easy to just organically grow and have traction. Yeah, I mean, Instagram today isn't organic. Like that word and Instagram just don't align. And everything on Instagram now is um, pay for play. Like you have to be so strategized. You're always trying different things. Um, even with Instagram now, I'm like, we'll put up some content that I think is like super engaging, super positive, super representative of the brand and no one will see it. And then we'll put up like a meme reel sort of thing and, you know, 3000 people will engage and it's like, oh, this is great. But like, that's not, again, what our communities, it's not us. Yeah, it's not, it's not what we're selling. It's not our community. It's, it's just a very small snippet of our humor or our wit. Um, so Instagram just, to be honest, has lost what it used to be in that like space that people could actually be together and feel seen and heard and have like a virtual community that used to very much be community oriented and based and I met so many people on Instagram that I now know in real life like some of my closest friends were my internet friends from Instagram and we are now real life friends but I just don't think that that's the same same space anymore no and it's so sad because I agree with you like there's so many people that I've met through Instagram that are now like like either I work with or are actually good friends um, but like how do you what's our options now like not even just as a brand or as a business as a person um, but even as a person like yeah. how do you connect and and build those like conversations and I know that like maybe some people are still seeing some of that happen mm -hmm. but the platform itself just makes it so hard for um, people to do that. Yeah, I think the platform is just not user friendly anymore. I think it's a simple way of putting it. Like the people who yeah. are mm -hmm. using the platform are no longer enjoying it. I think, you know, to jump on the Gen Z trend, it's TikTok. That's where everyone's spending time everyone of many different ages too. It's r truly not just Gen Z. And um, yes, there's a lot of dancing, but there's also a lot of other things. And it's the nice thing about TikTok is it's similar to what Instagram used to be. It's not so perfect. It's not so filtered. It really is authentic. Like you see a lot more women not wearing makeup talking on TikTok, which you would literally never see on Instagram. So there's a lot more of like the real sense of authentic organic life that I think we're all craving from uh, a digital space because everything seems so filtered and perfect nowadays. Totally. What was your mindset? Like, I know you're on Instagram um, as very young, like, and I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners struggle with is like getting, changing their mindset and adopting a new platform is actually really hard. So what, hard. How have you approached that? Like, what was your mindset as you like jumped in and tried out TikTok? I think for me, it took a while, I'm going to be honest. Like I had a lot of people being like, you have to get on TikTok. So when it started getting big in North America, I obviously secured the It's Mary Young handle because I'm like any app that comes out, we need to have the same handle. There's no way we're losing this. I'm not buying this from someone. Um, so I went and got that handle and then I didn't post for like eight months. And I think part of it was like this imposter syndrome of like, do I know what I'm doing for TikTok? I knew Instagram so well. I knew how to um, like perfect the formula of Instagram and grow the community and have the two-way conversation. And TikTok is just very different. And it's not like to grow on TikTok, to go viral on TikTok. It's not like good content. It's more controversial content. You need to have content that people are jumping into your comments and going back and forth with each other, not even you. And you just kind of are there watching it all happen. So 
I think it's been it's been hard also as a lingerie brand. We have had our account frozen a bunch of times and I'm so scared of like ever losing our account. So lots of emojis are used over certain parts of the body, which doesn't really help when we're trying to like sell a product or show you what you could look like in it. Um, so we try to use it more of like the storytelling of Mary Young. And again, we're, we're trying to find ways that um, we can get that community built and that conversation going that doesn't feel too edited because part of it too is we are coming from Instagram where everything is, you know, really nice graphic design. Everything feels like it has like the brand tone of voice and it's stripping that back and just going back to like, yeah, it's me talking in my living room about something that relates to the business because that's going to connect with someone better than sitting in a, a studio that's not our studio. It's just a photo studio with perfect camera and perfect lighting. And it feels not, you know, relatable. So it's, it is really about like letting things go, trying things out. The trial and error is huge. And just like trying to actually have fun with it is big. Yeah. Mm. How have you managed, um, growing Mary Young, the business, but also being Mary Young, <laughs> like how much of your, personal like personality identity like is that infused in the brand and and how and have you set any boundaries to like separate them Mm, very very good question um majority of my personality and like my values are infused in the brand it really does feel like an extension of me and I think with it being my name people want to feel connected to me which is something that I constantly have to remember that like people do want to know who Mary is, what Mary does. And so I I am trying to be better about like opening up what my life looks like and how it, it relates to the brand. But I think, again, like those values and, and mission of the brand is truly like from my heart. And that's why it stayed true over the last, you know, eight years that we've had the business. But I definitely went through a period, I think it was probably 2017 and 2018, where I felt like there was no Mary the person and Mary Young the brand. Like there was there was no separation. And so I had to really um, try to find like friends in a community that didn't see me for my work. And I'm sure a lot of people experience this when you're growing something and it's getting bigger is your your friends want to talk about your job because it looks really cool to them. But you're like, this is still my job. And I sometimes hate it, even though I made this job for myself. Like I can still hate going to work sometimes or what's on my plate. And so... Um, finding space and finding the right people to let me just just be me and not relate back to the business I think has been really helpful and then it's it's a constant struggle of remembering that like the brand success doesn't tie to my personal success just because it's my name doesn't mean that like if the brand has a bad month or whatever it may be that I'm somehow failing it's there's so many other things going on and just knowing that like I've I, as an individual, am am succeeding in my own right, in my own ways. And having that conversation with myself over and over still to this day is something that I do. What's a, what's a side of you as a person that maybe doesn't get portrayed through it's Mary Young to your customers that you kind of get to unleash a little bit when you're Mm -hmm. with your friends and your family, stuff like that? Um, I would say that like my kind of tomboy side of me, like I'm a lot of people who follow Mary Young know that I'm into basketball and sneakers, but I'm definitely like, I grew up on a farm and I rode horses. And so I'm like very like jump in and let's do it and have a good time. So I think that aspect of me, that's not so like fashion and, you know, girly, but the way that people look at fashion being a very like feminine um, space. I'm, I would say that I have a lot more masculine energy that people don't necessarily see and are are more surprised. Like I've, I've been told many times that like, Oh, I just didn't really imagine you having such masculine energy. And I'm like, I, I still don't know what that means, but I guess I'll take it. (laughs) Well, I mean, I've always respected the, the sneaker collection that you've got going for sure. (laughs) Love that. Um, Um, I was going to ask if you were to do it all over again, you know, if you weren't Mm -hmm. just to happen upon it, if you were, to just wake up one day and be like, I want to start a fashion brand and this is my life's calling and it has nothing to do with a thesis or a school project. What would you change about how you launch and, and like what goes into the brand and things like that? Um, I think the biggest things I would change about launch is trying to see what's happening in the industry and really jump on it early. So seeing e-commerce and instead of 
e-commerce telling me that's where we're going to sell, start to really focus on e-commerce instead of focus on wholesale. And similar with like TikTok, like looking at things where they're going and just being less reserved or hesitant to dive in. And I think one of the biggest things, and I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs feel this, is the imposter syndrome is very real when you have your own business. I think not giving that any energy or any space to grow or dwell is something that I still, you know, I'm always working on, but I would really want to um, focus on that as I, I was younger growing the brand is having more confidence and sort of like you need to have this blind confidence that what you're doing is changing the world. Otherwise, how are you going to get up every single day, not just Monday through Friday, but literally every single day and commit to doing this and building your own path. So I think just being more confident in myself is something that I, I have now, but I really wish that I would have, um, you know, focused on when I was younger. Mm -hmm. In your perspective, do you think that every business owner is maybe especially in the like fashion space needs to be a content creator? Before I would say no, but now I would have to say yes. I think we see a lot yeah. of brands that are very successful, not because of the the product themselves, but because of the name and the face behind them. So, you know, we see a lot of influencers and bloggers that have now their own clothing line or their own homeware line and things like that. And if they're not the one who is the relatable part of the brand, then why is someone buying that brand? And I think that's, again, where like the confidence of me being this content creator and this person, this this Mary Young that people can relate to and meet is what I'm always working on. Because to me, I'm like, I'm just this, you know, girl who grew up in a small town of literally 50 people. I had horses, like, I don't know why people want to know what my life is. But now I'm like trying to lean into that and be like, I do need to create the content. I do need to have those conversations, open them up. If I'm asking my community to be a part of that, then I also need to lead my community in that way. Yeah, that takes a lot of self leadership. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. <laughs> and discipline, like to oh. be doing that constantly. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's just it's a lot of work. It but is. if not, then like you have to rely on other creators, and then like they might not always be around. So there's less exactly. consistency, and and if people build a relationship with someone who isn't part of the company, and then they're not no longer promoting it then mm -hmm. there's like obviously more disruption too so it makes a yeah. lot of sense mm -hmm. yeah because then they just get loyal to that one person that one influencer and then if that influencer goes somewhere else then they're going with them so it is about like having that touch point of one person or maybe a handful of people behind a business that the community can really connect with mm -hmm. Um, we like to ask all of our guests this question, and you've already given lots of advice mm -hmm. on this episode, but uh, what's one piece of advice that you've been given that stuck with you? The biggest piece of advice I was given is to calculate your risks. So being an entrepreneur is risky. There's no way to, you know, ignore the risk that comes with it, and it'll always feel like it's too risky. So looking at something like you do with an investment or buying a pair of sneakers, what's the return going to be if you want to flip them later? Um, you want to calculate your risks. You want to see, okay, if I you know, invest this much money, what, at what point will I stop investing money? How can I maintain this? Like draw a line in the sand for yourself of knowing how far you're gonna, going to push yourself. And if it's still not working at that point, that's okay. You can put this idea, this business on the shelf because sometimes your, our ideas are a bit too head of, ahead of the curve. And other times our ideas just need a, a longer nurturing process to grow for the community to feel connected to them. So when you calculate your risks, you feel way more... Um, I would say confident in knowing what you're going to do and you have that plan. So you're not just like going out on a whim and thinking it's all going to work and you haven't done the research. So calculate those risks. And then when you're about 80% confident, because it's very hard to get to 100%, you just have to go for it. You have to jump off that cliff and just take that chance. That's good. I, I feel like I've received similar advice, and but maybe in different words. And, and from my experience, it's been just like, know your worst case scenario, yes. like come to terms with the worst case scenario. And if, it, mm -hmm. if you know what that is and you can still move forward and you know that you can recover from that, then like that gives you a good kind of like frame of reference mm -hmm. to, to what you're doing. But yeah, that's great advice. Another question we always like to ask is, um, and you obviously have your finger on the pulse of a lot of, of a lot of what's happening and what's cool. And, um, even like in, on the sustainability side as well. Um, but from your perspective and from who you're watching, who would you say is making waves right now and why? 
Ooh, who's making waves? Um, I would say one individual that I I would say she yeah she's been waking making waves and I think she will continue is Pia. Uh, I don't know how to say her last name, but she's she's been very ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. She's also like a content creator for her, her brand. She has. I think two brands now, two clothing brands, and she just became a new mom. She's having open conversations around that. I think she's really just setting the tone for an authentic uh, leader in a space and being relatable and reachable, which I think is, uh, again, what we don't see a lot in the social space. She's really uh, breaking down those like invisible barriers. Mm-hmm. She has a podcast too. Like, I think it's Everything is the Best or something. Yeah. Yeah. She also has a podcast. Yeah. So I know her voice in my ears a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's awesome. I follow her. Mm-hmm. So we'll make sure that we link it in the show notes. Perfect. Love it. Well, that's all, Mary. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing your time and your, your wisdom and your experience. Um, this was a treat. This was a lot of fun. Sure. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. I mean, I could talk to both of you for hours. <laughs> I know. Maybe we'll have to do a round two. We recently had a, a guest on for the second time, so mm-hmm. we won't rule that out. Okay, perfect. Well, you know nice. how to find me. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm.